So, what we did was uh, we looked at a general form of a partial differential equation, then we looked at the classification in terms of linear, semi linear, quasi linear, and non linear. Then we have defined all these forms. Then we looked at several examples from the real life, various differential equations that we have given, they were all corresponding to those from the real life. And then we made after giving all the examples, we made an important comment that these equations that we have proposed or we have or we have recalled they should be meaningful in the sense that they should be well posed. What is the meaning of the well posed that we have recalled the way Hadamard has defined in an informal way. So, to recall that for a PDE to be considered as a well posed model, firstly the solution of the given problem should exist, it should be unique and it should continuously depend on the given data in the sense that if there is a small perturbation in that given data, then there should be a small perturbation in the solution, the solution should not blow up. So, this is a very in a very simple and an informal way the Hadamard's theory states. So, this is where we end it and then I said that I will comment on what is called as a classical solution and what is the difficulty with the classical solution and why we have to look differently. So, these are the points which we will try to look at. Now. So, just to recall again let us state again our general form of the partial differential equation that we have given. So, recall an expression of the form f of d k u of x, d k minus 1 u of x Call this is a one, this is a partial differential equation of order k we said, and our interest is to find the solution u. Then we gave different forms of this f when it becomes linear, semi linear, quasi linear, and we went on to give several examples. Now, what is this? Classical solution. classical solution to problem 1. What do we understand by classical solution to problem 1? Classical solution to problem 1 means that we would like to find a solution u which is an unknown basically it is a mapping from u to r. What is this u which satisfies this equation? So, what is the requirement of this expression? this u should be k times continuously differentiable. So, highest order derivatives should be continuously differentiable, should be available, it should be continuous. So, that is a requirement. So, classically if you are trying to find a solution which is a mapping from u to r, the additional bindings on that are that not only that they should all these derivatives up to the order k should exist and they should satisfy the given equation. So, that is what is the classical requirement of the problem. So, if you can find a u whose k dot a differential who which is k times differentiable and it satisfies the expression 1, then we say it is a classical solution to the given partial differential 
equation. In general, the problems that we deal with, real life problems, to have this kind of k times differentiability is not always possible. If you have this demand, probably it will be very difficult to get the solutions for very many practical problems, which as we have seen a class of problems linear, semi linear, quasi linear. So, especially when it is going on coupled system of equation, coupled linear systems, coupled nonlinear systems. So, to get any solution for this, which is going to handle all these situations is not always possible. So, it is better to come out of this very rigid framework and be slightly flexible. So, we move out from this classical framework of the solution to get some way, some meaningful, uh, something meaningful. So, we move out from what is the classical notion and we think of what is known as the weak solutions. Again, we are only talking of uh, things in a very general fashion, we do not have time to go to the details of PDEs, but we will just highlight it. What is a weak solution? We do not at least want to have the binding that the u which is a mapping from capital U which is a subset of uh, R n to R to have is k partial derivatives existing and being continuous. We do not want such a strong binding, we want the binding to be relaxed. So, that relaxation leads to what is known as weak solution. So, now we will talk about weak solution and also under what conditions a weak solution can also become a strong solution. So, usually a weak solution under regularity conditions will become can become equivalent to a strong solution. So, we just get a general feel of regularity conditions. So, firstly what is the need for a weak solution? Let us consider the situation of a simple class, uh, uh, scalar conservation law. So, why weak solution? So, let us take the example of simple scalar conservation law. So, let us consider the case of scalar conservation law, which is uh, in the morning we have seen that the scalar conservation law we have written in one of the examples. So, So, what does this PDE do? This is a partial differential equation. Let us suppose that we are looking in a 1D case. So, let us say that we are in one dimensional situation. So, the where do these scalar conservations law usually occur? They usually occur in the context of So, in this context we usually see this uh, scalar conservation laws. So, usually when for instance uh, uh, formulation and propagation of shocks, shock propagation. So, in the context of the shock propagation we come across this uh, scalar conservation loss. So, what is basically a shock? A shock is basically a curve of discontinuity of solution u. So, simply a shock wave a curve of discontinuity okay. 
So, what we are saying it is a curve of discontinuity, it is in a discontinuity of the solution what of the solution u. So, by inherently by the very definition it is a curve of discontinuity that means, we are expecting the solution to be discontinuous. So, that means, we would like to allow the discontinuities to come into the picture. We would like that these derivatives need not be defined the solution nature itself is that. So, but if you want to talk of a strong solution it demands that the kth order derivatives should exist and they should be continuous and they should satisfy this. But if the phenomena is involving something like a shock it, it by definition itself it has got a discontinuous curve it is. So, across that curve there is a discontinuity there. So, it is demanding the physical phenomena is demanding a discontinuity. So, if you want to talk of solution for this in a classical way it becomes very very difficult rather will be will not be able to find a solution which is going to satisfy in a classical sense. So, you need to come out of this classical sense because these problems the solution do it practically we face these problems we need to have a solutions for this. So, we cannot be continuous sticking in the classical sense to that. So, we have to come out of the classical sense. So, when you want to come out of the classical sense to handle this kind of situations. So, we move into what is known as a weak solution. So, where we try to find the de define what is known as the de more generalized versions of the derivatives. So, the derivative need not exist in the classical sense, but in a weak sense the derivative can exist. For the want of time again we are not going to go into definitions of the weak derivatives etcetera for now. So, in this context it is better to think of weak solutions. Because in a classical sense we cannot have any solution, because uh, uh, there is a shock, shock means there is a discontinuity that means solution in, in what in solution. Therefore, we have to come out of it better to think of a weak solution, which means uh, you are going to talk about derivatives in a not in a classical way, but in a weaker way. What usually you do in this context is if you want to define a derivative in a weaker sense what we do is we take the help of very smooth functions we get into the integral framework push this derivative through the integration by parts from the field variable on to a very smooth function and we define the derivative in the weaker sense in this integral framework which are which are known as distributions that is in a distributional sense that we will derive define what is known as a weak derivative. So, when we actually come into the distributions and when we actually come into the some basic introduction to Sobolev spaces we will talk little more about it right now I think it is a, a recall maybe some of you already know it and some of you who do not know we will anyhow get introduced to that. Now, why do we need to talk about derivatives in a weaker sense because we know we are facing problems this shock propagation problem is very common we have we need to find solutions for that there are solutions for it. So, we find the solution for that in a weaker way in a weaker sense right. So, if you want to talk of the existence and uniqueness because a well postness says the solution should exist solution should be unique and solution should continuously depend on the initial data. So, in this case when there is a discontinuity because there is a shock which it is representing how can you even talk of existence of the solution in the strong form. So, if you want to talk of existence uniqueness all these aspects then we have to talk in a weaker sense. So, we come out of that problem from the strong sense. So, strong sense means the problem in its differential form as such. So, that is the strong form of the problem. So, if you talk of a so the classical solution is a solution for the strong form of the problem. So, if you move away from it and relax some conditions like that I do not want these derivatives to exist in this fashion then I think you are going to move out in a classical way out and you will go into a weaker context that will become a weak solution which will help us to talk about existence and uniqueness of the given problem through the weak formulation right. So, that is where we want to talk about what is the uh, strong form of the problem and the weak form of the problem that is where they become very important now. So, some of the difficulties regular difficulties we will talk about uh, this strong form and how to get into the weak form of the problem when we actually get into the finite elements. So, uh, in the 
previous session we talked about uh, when we were dealing with the lab session, I uh, we uh, discussed the integral form of the partial differential equation which is Laplace equation, right. So, it was in fact a weak formulation. The derivatives there were all defined not in the classical sense, but in the distributional sense. So, we will anyhow come back to that what is the distributional derivatives. So, the derivative need not exist in a classical way, but still we can we will be able to talk about the solution for that. So, now we have an idea that there is something called as a classical solution and there is something called as a weak solution for the problem. Now, can a weak solution be as good as a strong solution? Of course, it is a weak solution. So, given a problem instead of uh, satisfying the given equation in a modified version which is an integral framework. So, we get a weak solution it need not be as good as a strong solution, but under certain assumptions which are known as regularity assumptions a weak solution can become a strong solution under the regularity conditions. So, we will see all these things a little more clearly when we get into the finite element framework where the weak solution comes and what are the regularity conditions, when does it become a strong solution. Simply let me just highlight suppose you do integration by parts for a problem and then what you do you reduce the order of the derivatives and in the integral framework, but if you want to do again a repeated integration by parts get back the strong form you have to expect suppose a u x if you integrate it integration by parts of such a v and then if you were to push it you will get a term u x v x plus some other term right integration by parts so this is on the omega then you will have something on the gamma or do omega. So, if you want to get back this you have to integrate it back suppose you start with this you can get this suppose you start with this you want to get back to this one then you have to make sure that this exists. So, guaranteeing the existence of u x x starting from here is called as regularity condition. This is a very simple. So, you know only u x exists, but if you assume that u x x also exists that means, you are assuming something on the smoothness of the solution that is called as a that is in a very simple language that is that is a very very simple way of putting that if you want to go back you require solution to be more regular which means more smooth from u x. If you again do the integration by parts you want to go back you want to guarantee that this is if you already know this you can go to this, but if you start from here you want to go back to this you have to make sure that this exists or at least assume or at least justify under what condition this exists that is what is called the regularity. So, if you can guarantee the regularity of the given solution then you can move from here to here. So, for a given framework we have to what are the regularity conditions under what conditions we can guarantee that higher order derivative exists. So, that will become the set of the theoretical results which support the existence of higher order derivatives they become the regularity results. So, now we will we will talk about it more uh, uh, contextually. So, right now somewhere we will we have a PDE classification in terms of linear nonlinear then we also know the classical and weak so form of the solution right. So, classical solution satisfies as such this weaker form of the solution may be something like this it satisfies this right not this if a weak solution has to become a strong solution then one has to guarantee through the regularity conditions one can guarantee a weak solution is indeed a strong solution. Now, what are the typical difficulties that one would face while dealing with differential equations let us list out some typical difficulties. So, list out few typical difficulties when dealing with uh, PDEs. So, what are the typical difficulties? So, we have already seen linear and nonlinear PDEs. So, nonlinear PDEs are difficult to handle than the linear PDEs, okay, that is a typical one. So, nonlinear PDEs are 
a more difficult to handle. So, higher order PDEs are more difficult to handle than lower order PDEs. This is a common things which we know. Then lower order PDEs. Then systems are more difficult to handle than a single PDE. Systems are more difficult to handle. And by and large, for all PDEs, it is not possible to get closed form solutions. There is a luxury to have a closed form solution. If you have a closed form solution, you never would like to look at finite element method. Just solve it and that is the best solution that you can have, right. So, to get a closed form solution is always difficult. So, it is not always possible to get the closed form solution to this. So, these are some typical general difficulties that we would face it. Okay. Now, let us look at uh, classification of uh, second order PDEs. So, uh, we have now talked in general, we will focus on uh, second order PDEs and this classification, uh, very general classification in terms of elliptic, parabolic and hyperbolic equation the way we know. So, it is a quick recall because we have a standard elliptic, parabolic and hyperbolic equations we have it, we just recall it. Probably after that we will be able to because the, the flow equation that we are going to talk are going to be talked in terms of parabolic, elliptic and hyperbolic equations. So, we need to know about this classification to linear, non-linear is one and elliptic, parabolic, hyperbolic we need to look at it. For that I think uh, let us talk about this classification through the second order PDEs. So, now let us now consider the second order PDEs. So, once again let us consider the classical form of the, uh, consider the linear PDE. So, it is a recall that we are doing. So, types of the PDs, let me say it is a recall. So, because uh, we already know all this, it is a recall on this. Suppose or say if u x x, I want to define a characteristic polynomial. How do we get a characteristic polynomial? Is actually replacing all these derivatives in terms of polynomial variables there. So, u x x is uh, formally replaced by 
by alpha square u x y is replaced by alpha beta u y y is replaced by beta square is replaced by alpha then the polynomial that is associated with this p d e 1 can be written as so one is associated with a polynomial in terms of alpha and beta which is uh, given by p of alpha beta is a alpha square plus 2 b alpha beta plus c beta square plus d alpha Now, uh, why I am writing this? Because we wanted to classify it as elliptic parabolic, we always classify it to this uh, polynomial, which is a characteristic polynomial. Now, we will be able to talk about our classification. So, now the remark is as the follows. So, the remark one is the polynomial p alpha beta together with together with its p d one is classified as hyperbolic if the discriminant b square minus a c is positive, it is elliptic or it is parabolic. So, what is that you are noting here? This is we all know it all this, right. But what is that uh, we note here when this classification of hyperbolic, parabolic, and elliptic is basically based on this discriminant? And this discriminant is basically defined using the principal part. the coefficients involved in the principal part that means, the highest order derivative terms are second order terms in this case as a degree polynomial of degree 2 all that coefficients which are involved in polynomial of degree 2 exactly the second degree coefficients are used or other words these are all the coefficients which are coming up which are associated with the highest order derivative. So, this is something which we directly notice. So, what happens if we were to so, ok this second order p d e it is fine suppose I can also have a second order p d e in n variables. So, this is in terms of x and y. So, to be more general we have the notion of Eigen values classification based on Eigen values. So, let us also recall that we also know Eigen values how it is defined in terms of the Eigen values. So, for a more general form that is how we usually use the Eigen values for classifying the equations correct. 
So, suppose your u is a function of x, y, z or x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4, x n that is your independent variable you are in R n. Then I think the most convenient way is to look at the eigen values of the matrix associated with the quadratic form of the given characteristic polynomial. Right? So, we will also try to recall this is one classification which we already know. Let us also try to recall the classification based on the eigen values. All this is important for us when we go for the fluid flow analysis, because uh, the methodology that we are going to develop will be different for elliptic, parabolic and hyperbolic. So, we need to really look at uh, given an equation as elliptic, parabolic, hyperbolic we need to identify. Accordingly, we need to choose the uh, methodology. So, the well postness of the given model after having got that in the second order problem uh, in two dimensions or three dimensions or four dimensions, we need to really look at it. Then classify as elliptic, parabolic, hyperbolic then accordingly define the methodology according to following algorithm. So, for there for that it is going to be very important. So, we need to understand all that in a very general framework of PDEs. So, that is why this point these points are being emphasized. So, now we will consider so let us consider the general Linear partial differential equation of order 2, but in n variables. So, this is of the form, let us say that is of the form. this is u of x i and x j is same as u of x j and x i, then the principal part can be rearranged. So, that the matrix related matrix becomes symmetric. So, in this case I have moved out from x y to second order P D E in R n. So, in terms of n independent variables. So, when you are able to rearrange in this way, then the matrix A which is associated with it comes out to be symmetric. So, what is the advantage of this? Then we know from the linear algebra that a symmetric matrix of this kind has got real eigenvalues, n real eigenvalues. Maybe they are repeated, but they can have n real eigenvalues. So, 
from linear algebra we know that such a matrix has got And these eigenvalues are possibly the zeros of the characteristic polynomial in terms of lambda. We know this. So, which are nothing but the which are zeros of the Now, we will be able to classify the equation as hyperbolic, parabolic or elliptic based on this eigenvalues. We know all this. So, let us recall how do we classify now is a hyperbolic, parabolic, elliptic or ultra hyperbolic. Now, the classification follows as follows. So, let us suppose that p denotes the cardinality of positive eigenvalues or the number of the positive eigenvalues z denotes the number of 0 eigenvalues of our matrix. So, then the classification of the PDE. So, this classification of this PDE with is a second order PDE in n variables is the following. It is hyperbolic if it has 0 number of 0 eigenvalues and exactly one positive eigenvalue or zero number of 0 eigenvalues and n minus 1 number of positive eigenvalues. This is for the second order equation, this is for the nth order equation. Right? If there is going to be n, if a is going to be a part of n cross n, then this is what it is. If a is going to be n cross 2 cross 2, say. so in the two dimensions uh, it is going to be in the n dimension, that is what sorry not second order. For the second order it is in two dimensions, this is in n dimension. So, it is called parabolic if number of the 0 eigenvalues is more than 1, more than 0, if there are at least one 0 eigenvalue then it is parabolic. So, if z which is a coordinate count on the number of the 0 eigenvalues, so this basically means that determinant of this matrix A is identically 0. We know that even if there is one 0 eigenvalue then the determinant becomes automatically 0, in this case it is going to be parabolic. So, it is going to be elliptic if 
z is 0 and p is n, there are no 0 eigenvalues, all the eigenvalues are all the n eigenvalues are positive or there are no 0 eigenvalues, there are no positive eigenvalues, all the eigenvalues are negative. In that situation also it is going to be elliptic and it is called ultra hyperbolic, if number of the 0 eigenvalues is 0 and number of the positive eigenvalues can be anywhere between 1 and n minus 1, but it is not exactly 1, it is 2 and or n minus 2, it is between 1 and n minus 1. So, both 1 and n minus 1 are omitted, then it is called the ultra hyperbolic. So, now this is a classification which generally comes becomes very handy for us when we are talking of a general uh, equation, second order equation in n dimensions. So, we try to look at the characteristic polynomial, try to look at this matrix and find out all the eigenvalues and based on the eigenvalues, we will be able to classify the equation. Largely this kind of a classification uh, based on eigenvalues becomes very handy for very many practical problems. Right, I think that this is uh, some general, there are some examples, I do not think I will uh, really worry about getting into the examples and all that, because we only wanted to recall something. So, what we did it, we got an idea of what is a PDE. So, we classified in whether linear or non-linear PDEs, later we also classified based on its uh, characteristics defined in terms of eigenvalues or discriminants as hyperbolic, parabolic, elliptic or ultra hyperbolic partial differential equations and we know that we can have linear, non-linear, semi linear equation whatever it is and then the, with these characteristics. So, this is a quick recall on that and the important aspects that we emphasized are two things the well posedness is something very important for us to look at it in the sense of the Hadamard which talks about existence of the solution, uniqueness of the solution and continuous dependence on the given data. So, to accept a model to proceed further these are the first things that we need to look at it. So, where is well post? to what class it belongs, linear, non-linear and whether it is going to be hyperbolic, parabolic or elliptic. So, the nature of a equation can change if the coefficients are variables depending on the independent function, the nature of the equation can change from one part of the domain to another part of the domain. So, it can be elliptic somewhere, hyperbolic somewhere, a trichomous equation is a very famous equation, it exhibits different natures in different parts of the domain, you all know that, just a recall on that. So, with that I think uh, a quick introduction to partial differential equations, I end it because the our course is not on partial differential equations. So, why did we talk about it? We talked about it because we know our Euler equations, Navier-Stokes equations, Burgess equations, uh, transport equations, Porus media equations, which are all the equations which we are going to talk about in the fluid flow. They are all the PDEs either linear, non-linear, first order or higher order PDEs. We have seen that and we know how to classify them. Uh, so, this is very essential for us and well postness for these things becomes very important before we do any numerical series. So, next what we do is we will now switch the gears. So, fluid mechanics as you note it is a very essential part of our life. For instance, a human body has 65 percent of water, earth surface is a two thirds water, atmosphere extends 17 kilometers above the earth surface. In all these cases, this is, a, this, is a, this is all filled with fluids in different forms. So, history shaped by the fluid mechanics, geomorphology, human migration and civilization, modern scientific and mathematical theories and methods and warfare etcetera, these are all the things which were all shaped by fluid mechanics. In fact, wherever there is a human migration, people always try to migrate to a place where there is enough water available for them, enough air, water etcetera is available. People do not live high on the hills correct. So, they live in the places where water is available, we, we all understand these things. So, uh, fluid mechanics definitely is a very important ingredient of our life and it is uh, when we are sitting here without fluid flow in our body and blood flow and air that we take, we are not going to exist. So, it is uh, it affects every part of our life, sitting and listening, 
the sound waves being carried again you will be able to translate it in terms of uh, fluid mechanics equations there and the various things you will be able to talk in terms of that. So, if you go back to the history of the fluid mechanics uh, some of the important phases that we need to recall it is Archimedes first experiments on the fluid flow and uh, Newton's, Leibniz, Bernoulli, Euler these are Navier, Stokes, Reynolds, Prandtl's, Taylor these are some of the people who have contributed a lot for the growth of this subject these are the, the, the one cannot forget all these people. So, in the fluid flows is omnipresent. So, we have fluids in weather and climate if you want to understand the weather or if you want to talk something about the climate it is completely talking about the fluid flows and analyzing the fluid flows if you want to do the weather prediction I want to take any case. So, if you want to design vehicles or if you want to talk if I want to uh, the automobiles, trains, ships etcetera if you want to design these things for various reasons why do you would like to design you would like to uh, design it in such a way they are functioning in optimal way in the sense of uh, let us say suppose it may be would like to have uh, good mileage. So, uh, it need to have a aerodynamic shape or it need to have so for that we need to do completely fluid dynamic studies either on automobiles, trains, uh, ships various reasons. So, if you want to talk about the environment completely it is again the for example, air pollution or the air circulation within a room or outside. So, you want to have a clean environment these days this is why. So, fluid dynamics is then approach to study the model and study that physiology and medicine. So, fluid uh, human body for that matter is all filled with several biological fluids blood is one we have several enzymes we have bile we have all these if you want to study or all these kinds of or the cerebral finest fluid any of these fluids you want to look at and try to model and study again fluid dynamics is very important there. Sports for instance you want to design a cricket ball or a tennis ball this is one of the way important uh, uh, things in the industry these days to design a ball so that it will have a good swing or a good spin you would like to have whatever you want to so you have to design the ball if you want to do a design the ball then you would like to study its aerodynamics if you want to do that. So, it is actually fluid dynamics which is very much involved in that. So, or if you want to have the design of the sports uh, shoe for example, then we need to have in such a way that you get a uh, good uh, uh, you are able to run fast and you are able to have uh, effective feel from the shoes and then I think uh, again for designing of any of those things again uh, fluid mechanics plays an important role. So, there are many other aspects where fluid mechanics becomes very important there. So, if I other again we want to understand from the climate and the weather and climate point of view have want to understand the tornadoes why do we understand once there is a tornado we would like to know which way it is going to go and uh, how fast it is going to grow which are the areas which are going to be affected by that. So, if you want to study this once there is a tornado when a tornado is going to occur and where it is going to actually which is the direction usually it is going to take. So, we want to alert the people in a neighboring region so that they go into the safer zones then it is entirely fluid and mixed study. I want to understand that uh, thunderstorms and uh, it can cause thunderstorms we know it can cause lot of problems again this is a flow dynamic study and the global climate prediction fluid dynamic study uh, same problem with the hurricanes also if you want to study hurricane how the hurricanes come and hit the coast. So, if you want to understand want to give a prior warning to the people then again it is a problem of uh, flow modeling these things and predicting the things from the model from solving the models they all becomes a part of the fluid mechanics designing ships surface aircrafts or surface ships high speed rail submarine all these things once again is a part of fluid mechanics there. As we have said air pollution or the river hydraulics uh, in all these cases again if you want to see why do we would uh, we would like to know what is the direction which is going to spread what is the amount of the environment which is going to be affected by this how long this is going to persist if there is going to be any hazardous gas or toxic, toxic gas which is going to be released from it. So, one would like to be cautious. So, it will help you at least in uh, how far an industry usually industries are not placed within the city premises. So, it has placed quite quite outskirts. So, then uh, these are all the things how much it should be away from the central part of the city. So, that I think this is not going to immediately affect the uh, general society you know, one will be able to talk about it uh, once again about uh, talk about the river, uh, river hydraulics 
So, fluid dynamics becomes a means to model and talk about it. Then even if you want to device some de uh, devices like a blood pump, which is used in uh, heart surgery, open heart surgeries, we want to use, we have an extra corporeal circulation, but the blood, no more your heart is no more functional. So, you would like to circulate the blood and the blood still to keep the body functioning. So, since the heart is under, you are going to do some heart surgery, heart is no more in a normal condition. If you want to do that, then you need to have a blood pump, which is going to do the work of the heart, which is going to pump, which is in the extra corporeal circulation. You want to do this, you want to device, you want to actually design this device, then it has to Again, fluid mechanics plays an important role there. The similarly, ventricular assist device in, the in designing this device in a way such that the blood is not really damaged and it is also functioning nearly as if it is nearly physiological. We cannot replace exact physiological functioning, but nearly physiological. So, the damage done to the blood is minimal, then we need to design this thing. The fluid mechanics plays a very important role there. In the sports, Again, designing all these vehicles as water sports or cycling or offshore racing, auto racing, surfing and all these things, uh, uh, fluid mechanics becomes very important. There are a lot of competitions in designing these things because, so we know it is important how the, this has to be designed, this cycle has to be designed in a way that it is going to really have less drag forces and you are going to have a good amount of thrust and it is going to be effective in terms of uh, cycling and you should have a, a very good exercise for your uh, legs and so on and so forth, then all fluid mechanics plays an important role in designing these things. So, uh, fluids engineering in reality is fluids engineering the components and idealized and uh, uh, fluids engineering or the fluid flow analysis can be looked in three different way analytical fluid mechanics, experimental fluid mechanics and computational fluid mechanics. So, what we will do is we just quickly what is analytical, what is experimental, what is computational. We just have a three uh, quick look at these three things and what we are going to look is going to be only one aspect that is going to be the computational aspect. So, we need to look at the experimental aspect, we need to look at the analytical aspect which there are all the other components, but we are not going to really touch upon those things. So, so firstly analytical fluid mechanics, analytical fluid mechanics what we do is we have the entire flow situation is modeled in terms of the mathematical equations. So, what these mathematical equations supposed to do, these mathematical equations are supposed to model the physics which is a various interplay between the various forces that is exactly modeled by these equations. So, usually you use conservation laws for modeling this they obey some conservation laws you need to take into account these conservation laws and you come up with the equations which are satisfying which are satisfying these conservation laws at the same time describing the physical situation. So, for that to come up with this equation there be essentially different approaches one can use a control volume approach or one can use a differential analysis approach. I suppose you know in the derivation of this equation one use a control volume approach or the differential element approach. Then once we have this, so we have a mathematical representation for a given flow situation, then we can solve these equations. So, we can have exact solutions, but these exact solutions are what? It is a closed form solutions. The closed form solutions as we know, as we already commented when we were talking about the partial differential equations. So, it is only for a very limited set of equations, we can have the luxury of having a closed form solution, largely because the geometries are either simple or the equations are linear, or then it is possible for us to have a closed form solution, otherwise it is going to be very difficult for us. But in the case of analytical fluid mechanics, we always look for this kind of a closed form solutions, either we get it in a closed form, if we are not able to get a closed form solution, then we at least we uh, get some approximate solutions for practical applications. We introduce some approximations, maybe you get a similarity solution or we may get a perturbation solution and things like that. So, uh, so we use uh, in a while defining this, we use some empirical relations using experimental fluid dynamics data. So, maybe use those data and then fit it and try to get some kind of a solution there. So, the sample, the simple uh, sample for the analytical fluid dynamics, let us say that we are trying to analyze uh, a flow in a laminar laminar flow in a pipe right that is a pipe and there is a laminar flow and uh, uh, let us suppose there are some uh, governing parameters non dimensional parameters we will we all know that what are these non dimensional parameters for, in, for instance it is a Reynolds number it is a ratio of the inviscid forces to the viscous forces that you have that in the case when the Reynolds number. So, you know this is the inertial forces which is uh, having the initial term u there rho is the density uh, rho is the density and d is the diameter of this. Uh, 
parallel pipe and uh, rho u d by mu that is the Reynolds number and if the Reynolds number. So, the uh, rho is the density and mu is the uh, coefficient of viscosity there and based on and u is the typical velocity. So, what we this Reynolds number uh, if it is less than 2000 then this is the kind of the scenario that we have it here. So, what we do is the given equations under the assumptions of that this is a laminar uh, flow can be simplified and one can get a simplified solution like this. Once we have a simplified equation, see in this case it is a steady state flow that this is knocked out and this is uh, the flow does not vary in the x direction because you have. So, that this is knocked out then what you have is there is only a variation in this then the simplified equation has got only one two two terms and the gravitational forces are neglected on this. Then we get a simplified differential equation and we have the luxury of having a closed form solution. So, you integrate it out and you have a luxury of having a closed form solution. Once you have a closed form solution, what is it talking? It is talking about the velocity u which is a function of r alone. right? So, that is a closed form solution and then based on which one will be able to talk about various post processing quantities like friction factor and then head loss and the one will be able to talk and this is a solution profile that one has one can have. This is a simple uh, situation where we can have the luxury of having a closed form solution. So, to get this closed form solution again some more details here I mean we will skip these details. Uh, so, in this case when we have this we have to get into a non dimensional form. So, the non dimensional form we introduce non dimensional parameters. So, you have a uh, dimensional quantity divided by a, you have here a typical velocity is a u star and then uh, this is a non dimensional u because the dimension of u and dimension of u is cancelled out similarly the non dimensional y which is uh, y plus which is written as. So, you have a non dimensional terms defined there and uh, you can come up with the, uh, the in this case what we are looking at is we are basically looking at turbulent flow in a smooth pipe. So, you are having some uh, three layer concepts here and the using this three layer concept sub layer laminar sub layer overlap sub layer and out layer these three things are defined in this situation. And I think let us not get into the details of this we just wanted to have some idea about uh, uh, analytical fluid mechanics one can handle turbulent flow in a smooth pipe one can also have a turbulent flow in a rough pipe one can think of uh, uh, these things and uh, once again this flow is uh, categorized uh, in terms of inner layer outer layer and overlap layer. So, we let us not worry about this. So, uh, now next let us look at what is known as the experimental fluid dynamics. In the experimental fluid dynamics once we say the analytical fluid dynamics we have a mathematical model we have a closed form solution for that. Next thing that we are going to look at is the experimental fluid dynamics. In experimental fluid dynamics uh, use of experimental methodology and the procedures for solving fluids engineering systems including full and model scales large table and top facilities uh, measurement systems uncertainty analysis and dimension analysis and similar and similarity. So, uh, what basically we are doing here we are using an experimental methodology for analyzing a fluid flow for instance for finding the uh, velocities etcetera we use fully experimental setup. So, decision what are the uh, experimental fluid dynamics philosophy decisions on conducting the experiments are governed by the ability to ability of the expected test outcome. So, you expect the outcome and you design an experiment as per that. So, that so you have the integration of these things uh, take important role test design determination of error sources estimation of uncertainty and documentation of the results. So, the basically these are the steps which are involved in the experimental fluid dynamics. So, the purpose again is to understand investigate phenomena and substantiate and validate the theory or for research development it can be uh, for uh, to provide a benchmark data to calibrate instruments equipment and facilities in the in the context of the industry it is uh, design optimization analysis and provide data uh, product liability acceptance etcetera. So, the next one is our computational fluid dynamics. So, this is what our focus is going to be our computational fluid dynamics based on finite element method. So, applications what we would like to actually compute this what is this, this is a flow pass this is what the standard is known as our uh, one Karman street which is a flow past a spear basically what you have here. So, is a vortex shedding basically. So, we would like to the picture of Karman vortex shedding. So, this is something very important uh, 
in the context of science and technology, one would like to actually numerically simulate these things. One will be able to uh, do experimentally, but one would like to simulate this in various uh, complex situations uh, where we have a, a cylinder which is no more stationary. We have a multiple cylinders probably there, there is a lot of interaction which takes place. So, firstly to begin with uh, how to computationally simulate such a kind of uh, carbon vortex shedding is one of the benchmark problems there. So, the typically if you want you can also do this kind of uh, studies uh, in an experimental setup which is in a wind tunnels. We have a wind tunnel in our institute, uh, we will be able to set up all these things and probably able to study in a tropic wind tunnel has the ability to create uh, temperatures from 0 to 165 Fahrenheit and applications in research and development. So, uh, we will be able to do that. This again in the experimental fluid dynamics, this is also in the experimental setup there. So, application of the experimental fluid dynamics again has. Uh, so, this is in a wind tunnel, what you have here is a wind tunnel and then uh, what we see here is we would like to actually study the stresses and the strains probably on this uh, uh, model of aeroplane. So, we are going to place this in the wind tunnel and then probably we will be able to study it and this. So, this is uh, the basically fluid dynamics laboratory, this is experimental setup, this is experimental fluid dynamics in the fluid dynamics laboratory. So, uh, in this we have to scale down the models and then maybe even the laboratory models, we, we will not be able to study on the real model, we have to scale down and then probably study or we may have to uh, study some comp on some components. So, the let us now get into, there are several steps involved in it, I will not get into all these details there. So, we will get into the computational fluid dynamics aspect of it. So, we looked at the analytical part, we looked at the experimental part now, the computational fluid dynamics part. So, what we have seen here in the analytical and the experimental part, let us get back to this. What we, we had a model here analytical fluid dynamics and laminar flow, we had a model, we solved it and we got this, we would like to do this computationally. So, in the experimental fluid dynamics, we had uh, we had an experimental setup in a something like a wind tunnel. So, we would like to actually simulate the flow past the plane, its wings or its uh, main body or its uh, nose, whatever it is. So, we would like to actually study these things. So, that is in an experimental setup. If you want to actually do in a computational setup, we are going to completely move into using computer as a tool. Computational fluid dynamics uh, is a use of computational methods for solving fluids engineering systems, including modeling, which basically calls for mathematical and uh, mathematics and physics. Then once we have a model to solve this, we need to go for numerical solvers or finite difference methods or finite element methods, so on and so forth. So, uh, rapid growth in CFD technology since the advent of computers, which we all know that. Okay. The purpose of the computational fluid dynamics is uh, clear. The objective is to model the continuous fluids with partial differential equations and to discretize the PDEs into an algebra problem solve it, validate it, achieve the simulation based on design. So, simulation of a physical fluid phenomena that are difficult to be measured by experiments. So, this is where it is very difficult to design an experiment and measure one resorts to computational fluid dynamics approach. So, the we will be able to use full scale simulations here. So, scale simulations can be carried out in this case, whereas you have it in the laboratory situation, maybe you have to really use dimensional analysis and scale it down. So, if you want to handle the situation which are hazardous, a laboratory situation becomes very difficult. For example, if you want to simulate explosions or radiations or pollution, then it is very difficult to carry out the experiments, rather it is hazardous to carry out experiments. In that case, we resort to computational fluid dynamics. So, if you want to understand the physics related for weather prediction or planetary motion and stellar evolution, CFD seems to be the way out. So, what are the ingredients in the CFD? So, firstly the mathematical physical problem formulation of the fluid engineering system. So, we need to have a mathematical model. So, mathematical model consists of governing equations, governing equations can be Navier-Stokes equations which is basically talking about conservation of momentum and conservation of mass in terms of continuity equation or and we have a pressure Poisson equation, energy equation, ideal gas equation equations uh, related to chemical reaction, multiphase flows, uh, the rally equation or we can have a turbulent flow models like RANS, LES or, da, or DES. So, these are all the mathematical models which is going to be the first part. Then we have to 
So, look at what is the coordinate system in which we are going to really handle whether it is going to be Cartesian or cylindrical or spherical coordinate systems or it is going to be an Allerian framework or it is going to be a Lagrangian framework or ALE framework one has to look at it. Once we have decided all these things to close this, we need to have initial and the boundary conditions. Then we also need to define the flow conditions. So, geometric approximation, domain, Reynolds number, Mach number, etc., all these things will get into the so, so called modeling. This becomes a very important step in the pre processing. Once we have all these things, then we go about simulating the flow. So, this is a flow past an airfoil which is at angle there, some science position in some, some angle there. Sorry, this is a free surface animation for a ship, not for the airfoil. For the free surface animation for ship in regular waves, that is what you have seen. So, in this case we need to have a model flow past this and then uh, we need we need a model as we have seen here, we need methodologies for uh, handling this. So, we will get into the details finally, when we use a free firm maybe we will be able to handle all this and these are some snapshots of. So, what is this? This exactly we are saying unsteady ram simulation, the free roll uh, decay motion, I think this is. Uh, a decay motion, yes. So, in this case, what we are having LES turbulent jet back wall shows a slice of dissipation and okay, there is something to do with the turbulent flow mechanics here. So, this is basically the vortex setting which is captured in the three dimensions. So, if you want to do this, uh, maybe we need to have a appropriate model, it could be something like LES model or DES model, one of these models probably one has to use sophisticated models to come up with this kind of simulations there. So, uh, we will look at uh, uh, this kind of to, up to obtain these kind of results, one need to have numerical methods. So, for instance, it will be finite difference methods, probably we will have a quick look tomorrow or finite volume method. Then we have already seen that we are never going to look at a continuous domain, we are going to discretize this. So, we need to have a grid generation, we already have looked at what it means to generate a grid. In fact, we will uh, now I think uh, your free from software with that you may be able to generate this kind of a grid. I uh, already given you an example where you have this kind of spikes coming up. So, you may be able to do it. Once we have this, then we have a discrete representation of the problem, then we go for uh, solvers. So, why do we need solvers? We have already seen that given PDE system is reduced in algebraic equation system, then we can go for direct solvers the iterative solvers. So, basically direct solvers are uh, Gaussian elimination, ELU decomposition, iterative solvers could be Jacobi, Gaussidel, so on and so forth. So, the basic steps involved in the CFD process is geometry, then go for the physics, mesh, solve, report and post process and these are the various steps which are involved in it. So, I think we will not get into detail, just for you to give a overlook look on uh, just a quick feel about what it is uh, fluid mechanics and what is computational fluid dynamics, we have just seen it. There are several commercial softwares at the moment we will not be interested in uh, this we are going to use uh, freefem. So, what did we look at it very quickly we glanced at uh, what is known as analytical fluid mechanics, experimental fluid mechanics and computational fluid mechanics. So, for all these things the basic thing is uh, for analytical and computational fluid mechanics the basic a very important basic thing is a fluid flow model. So, this fluid flow model, how are we going to have it? We are going to have a derivation, we will consider the simple situation of potential flow, we will try to derive this. For other things, we will quickly recall. So, with that, I think we will close our discussion on fluid mechanics. I think with this, I think uh, I will not get into the more details on this. So, we have the scenario of uh, analytical and, uh, or experimental or computational, where we are going for all the things for our for our both the experimental for the analytical and the computational, we need to have a fluid flow model. So, tomorrow we will look at the fluid flow model derivations uh, on the blackboard, we will not use the slides, this is just for you to get a quick feel. So, essentially it could be any one of these things, we are going to look at finite element method that is going to be essentially the tool for computational flow analysis. So, with that I think we close for the day.